Hey, welcome back to the studio. This is my day of play, where you're taken into the real events and actions of how it really went down before the process of editing and cleaning up. This is how it really went. We begin things with a couple of comedic podcasters that tell it the way it is. When it comes to conspiracy theories, oh my God. Their podcast is called My Mama Told Me. It's Langston Kerman and David Gorey. Then we're stepping into a pair of Disney shoes with Christina V and Bryce Pappenbrook from the animated series Miraculous. We'll wrap things up with an 80-year-old author from Australia who has this amazing way of bringing words on a page to life inside our imaginations. This is my day of play, completely unedited in the way of meeting the wizard behind the curtain. The name, because they all have their lane, and the shaman will shake. You'll expl- he'll let him explain why he's a shaman. Go ahead, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys, my God, I love your podcast. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. We Before we even get started, we got to talk about your tour because that is so important. You guys are going out on the road and people need to be checking you guys out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's called the Start the Steel Tour. It's uh, we're hitting 15 city, 14 cities uh, and we're 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 hitting all of them. We love it. We're it's, it's New York, L.A., Boston, D.C., Chicago, Denver, Austin, Houston, uh, Atlanta, Dallas, what Denver, uh, what San am I Francisco. forgetting? You, San you Francisco. Oh yeah, we <laughs> lots of places and and it's going to be very funny. David and I uh host this podcast, but we like to put on a, a great live show. So there are games, there's audience interaction, we're going to have insane guests. Um it, it's really going to be a great time, so people should come on out. About, about seven, eight years ago, there was a gentleman here in Charlotte at the Comedy Zone, Mike Hall. He, he sat down with me and he goes, you need, he says, the comedy clubs are going to change. He says, podcasting is going to change comedy. And do you, do you agree with that term, that it has? Uh, go ahead, David. Oh, yeah, I think, I think so for sure. I think that, uh, I think a lot of us were maybe worried it was going to usurp stand-up comedy, but I think it's definitely carved its own lane uh in the industry and we really have to take notice to what all these podcasts are doing right now yeah because i mean it, it's so amazing that first of all when i'm listening to your podcast my mama told me i mean i feel like i'm already right there with you but but to have that visual of you guys really bringing things together would be is, to me that's a that's a diamond in the rough yeah i mean so david and i both are stand-up comedians and we love live performance and so i think what gets exciting for us is being able to take these conversations that we have every day and put them in front of people's faces in a, in a really engaging way. Not just sort of, uh, sometimes you go to live podcasts and you're just watching two dudes talk, Mm -hmm. uh, in front of you in chairs. And we don't want it to be that kind of show. We really want it to be something that, that makes people feel involved, feel like to your point, it comes alive in front of them. How do you guys come up with the subjects that you're doing? Are you are you sitting around with a yellow a notebook and just going, okay, th- we're going to hit this one, but we can't practice it, save it for the air? Because I mean, I mean, th- I, I really did find it very interesting that people used to be green, and and it's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, let's be clear. I don't know if the takeaway from that is that we used to be green. <laughs> I I do think uh, certainly that is something that uh, some people would have you believe, but. No, nah, the, the subjects, the beauty of conspiracy theory is that it is an ever refilling source. Yeah. Um, people will always be speculating about truth and untruth. And uh, we thankfully have a, a, a lovely audience that continues to remind us that there are a bunch of things out there that we haven't heard before or that we need to hear. And, and somehow it, it keeps refilling itself. Is there a difference between a conspiracy theory and an urban legend? Hmm. I think that they, at least for our purposes, I think they kind of run run in the same circles. I, I, I don't see much of a difference. I don't see much of a difference. I think when it comes down to it, we're talking about the same thing, just uh, different terms. Yeah. Because conspiracy theories, to me, create the conversation. And I, and I swear that more and more people listening to My Mama Told Me, it's, it's almost like the fans need to be conversing back and forth as well, you know, in, in some sort of chat room or something, because you guys really bring up a lot of great stuff. Yeah, we, we, like, we like to be able to have any conversation that gets presented to us. I think 
Dave and I take a lot of pride in being uh, being able to take on the the more challenging conversations, but also the more sort of frivolous, silly conversations. We're not really scared of it uh, uh, because most of the time we we feel like we we can manage the responsibility of of reminding people that we're two dum dums who should not <laughs> actually be taken seriously. And yet, when you listen to your show, I don't I don't get that vibe at all. I mean, I really do take you seriously, and you're not dum dums. Well, then the trick worked. And now you're <laughs> falling for it. And we live to fight another day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think moms were always right, or was that a conspiracy? I think that uh, we have definitely proven through our show that, bless their hearts, moms are are privy to just as much bad information as the rest of us. Uh-huh. <laughs> Turns out moms can be dumb dumbs too, you know? Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my mom, the, the way she got out of conversation, she would look at me and go, son, I just don't remember. So let's, just, let's, let's break away from this conversation. I just don't remember. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of conspiracies around P. Diddy, and one of them, you kind of got my attention on this one with Clive Davis. Yeah, the <laughs> the weird history of, of Diddy and Clive Davis um, I watched a video actually just yesterday where where Diddy talks about having lost his job right before his first son is born and throwing this massive party in Harlem where people trashed his house. He w- he literally left his his pregnant uh, girl at the, or his his uh, newly born child and his his formerly pregnant girl at the the hospital so he could throw a party. And he says, "Thank God I met Clive Davis the next day." Uh, and so it changed everything for me. But yeah, they have a weird history together that I think is certainly going to come up in any legal trials that that he's now facing. Yeah, I don't know if it was clickbait yesterday or if it was a true story. I mean, there's even uh, LeBron James is now mixed up in a, in a conspiracy theory with P. Diddy. Yeah, I, it's hard to know what's real and what's fake in any of this stuff. I think it's it's certainly too early to to tell. And we don't know. I don't, none of us have any idea. I don't want to accuse LeBron's a great man. I don't want to accuse him of, uh, <laughs> of being a part of the freak offs too early. <laughs> Do you think we're living in the Matrix? Wow. Uh, big question so early in the morning. I do not. <laughs> Personally, I do not think that. I think it was just a movie. <laughs> and, and yet, you have to be able to look around yourself and go, oh my God, I think I've seen this before. Because there are so many events going on in the world right now that played out in Hollywood years before it actually happened. Yeah, I mean, I think I think what's amazing, uh, and one of the things you discover in comedy is that uh, is that the imagination, uh, while vast and ever expanding, also there's there's quite a bit of repetition inside of it, and I think we just happen to uh, imagine things that uh, that exist in the world or that could potentially exist in the world, and sometimes those things come true. People always point to The Simpsons and talk about how, like, yeah. how many of the things that they've claimed were true in, in jest eventually come true in real life. And it's like, that's that's a lot easier to do when you get 35 years on television to, to make new episodes. You know what I mean? If they predicted the Trump presidency in their first season and then got canceled, that's a, a very different game than if they get uh, 100,000 swings at it. Yeah. Speaking of different games, the world of comedy versus that of podcasting. In comedy, you've got to craft your stories. What about the podcasting? I mean, is it, is it stream thinking? Yeah. I it, go ahead. No, you got it. I was going to say, I think that to a point, I think that we are informed about the topics coming in. I think we both kind of come in with some ideas and uh, uh, thoughts about each topic. But I think definitely... We love the spontaneity of conversation, and I think we love having it open enough that these talks can go anywhere. Yeah, because I mean, what, first of all, to have a team player that's with you on your team is 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 amazing. Because I mean, it's eye to eye action. You're sitting there watching each other's body language, and so I mean, it, things go. You know, listeners have to understand what really goes on in creating a team like yours. Yeah, we we don't spend a lot of time prepping 
uh, for the conversation with each other, if at all. I mean, a lot of times the, the prep is just we start talking and forget to press record. Oh, um, <laughs> so much of, of the thing, so many of the things that we've said to each other, we should have been recording and haven't just because we'll jump on and start, you know, talking trash and, and find ourselves deep in a conversation that, that has not been documented, but we, you know, we, uh, he, he is very funny and, uh, and I try to be as funny as I can be. And so, we just uh, enjoy that, and thankfully, we have a great rhythm now. Yeah, because I mean, even even in a radio station studio, I mean, when you when we're in a commercial break, we're sitting there talking back and forth, and then we we have to literally t- say to each other, "Stop it, save it for the air," because we're gonna blow it here, and we don't need to shoot our wad right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of early wad shooting on our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> So what doesn't make it to the show? Do you guys sit down with the editor and go, ah, that we crossed the line on that one? That's rare, I would say, uh, where we we have ever acknowledged we've crossed the line. Um, and maybe, maybe we need to have more uh, in-depth conversations with our editor, but certainly we we take a lot of pride in, in not wanting to filter out the conversation and allow it to be what it is because so much of what conspiracy is is the raw reactions that people have to information it's not always a learned uh uh sort of interpretation it is like your first thought and sometimes that first thought is completely wrong Mm -hmm. but there's an element of truth underneath it when did you guys decide that it was going to be mini episodes versus, oh, you know, what, what, you know, a lot of people are going an hour and a half, two hours with their podcast, but you guys give me that quick fix. Um, I mean, I think, I think we wanted, we wanted both options, right? That we try, we do longer episodes on Tuesdays to make sure that we can talk to our guests and talk to each other in, in a more substantial way. But then, on a Thursday, if you just want to hear our voices and check in, we'll give you a little taste, you know, just a nip to to hold you over until the next big episode. We just want our audience to feel excited and engaged. And uh, I, I got kids. I can't talk to him for three hours every day, but I, <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to him as often as I can. Yeah, because, I mean, as a listener, when I see that a new show has popped up, I get excited. So I, I can't be the only one that gets excited, even if it's a, if it is a mini episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we hope everyone is excited. We hope everyone who listens to your show is excited. <laughs> if you're doing... Now, being down here oh, in the right. South, you know, man, we, we got some church ladies down here. So, I mean, and you guys aren't afraid to talk about that. No, we're, we're not afraid to talk about the church ladies, uh, but we welcome the church ladies. We hope. <laughs> Uh, that that the church ladies put on their big old hats yes. and, and come and see us uh, because we got stuff to say to y'all too. <laughs> one of, one of the things that I find very interesting, and I would love to f- uh, figure out how you guys are doing it, is answering listener emails. I mean, they're constantly sending you emails. I mean, it's I think that's such a connection, and and it kind of breaks down that wall of like you know we're imagining listeners are there, but you guys are proving listeners are there by answering them. Uh, yeah, you know, constantly receiving emails. That's the right word. It's just a Man. deluge of nonstop emails when we're not on the <laughs> air. We have so many to pick from. Aren't you Aren't you fascinated yeah. with how real people are, though? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, maybe more so than our guests at times. <laughs> <laughs> it's... it's- What's exciting is that our, our listeners, I think, find ways to not only introduce us to new conspiracy theories, but they also are are constantly holding us accountable for things that we've said. And and I we often assure them that we don't remember the things that we've said. We weren't uh, saying this with any real like seriousness, but they they treat it like it is the law and in a nice way. It kind of helps us create laws for the podcast. So when they do call you out, do you go through one of those cold sweats? Because man, I hate that feeling. I, I not too much. I mean, we like Langston said, we both acknowledge that we're pretty silly guys, and a lot of times it's just said in conversation, and we 
don't particularly remember. So I, it's not it's not so much a cold sweat as much as a. All right, I'm glad you guys are listening. Thanks for thanks for checking us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in your own way, how old do you have to be before people go? Uh, they're just going to say a bunch of crap, and because they're old guys. I mean, I realize you're not there yet, but I mean, in, in 20 years, I mean, it, which will be in the blink of an eye. What, is there a certain age where you know I can get away with this because I'm an old guy, and old guys get away with mm. everything. Well, I can't speak for Langston, but I'm only 23, so I have 20 more years. <laughs> yeah, if we're doing this podcast in 20 years, I, I think something went wrong. So I, my hope, my hope is that 20 years from now, I can tell this to uh, to people in in more private conversations that don't need to be recorded, right? Rather I- than- I also feel that kind of one of the beauties of our podcast is it's not age specific, right? Conspiracy theories really affect everyone. So it's uh, a lot, a lot of our topics I think are evergreen as far as age goes. Yeah. Speaking of conspiracies, Barack Obama putting a hit on Bernie Mac. I about fell out of my chair when I heard that. (laughs) (laughs) It's a, it was a bold one. That one I had. I really had to uh, make sure we were we were doing everything we could to be careful in because, uh, yeah, that's a it's a wild suggestion that that one of our most beloved comedians, I would say of all time, uh, was somehow assassinated by then uh, a then presidential candidate Barack Obama. Has anything shocked you guys? I mean, because I mean, with with the life that you live as it is, out on the road and doing the podcasting and being so open, is there anything that still shocks you? Uh, I think personally, <laughs> I come into it pretty skeptical a lot, yeah. so, or or open in a comedic way. So I think a lot of times the seeds of truth that some of these things have tend to be kind of shocking. You want to believe that, oh, we're just being salacious and a lot of it is silly. But some of this stuff is uh, is uh, rooted rooted in a lot of truth and that, that can sometimes can be tough to take. God, I love your podcast. I just I just want people to really go find it and let it become a part of their day. You guys have got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Oh, That's thank so you. nice. Thank you. Excellent. Will you guys be brilliant today, okay? You yeah, too. You too. This is so nice. Are you familiar with the Disney animated series Miraculous? Well, we're going to be with those voiceover actors from that series. Christina and Bryce are up next. Hello. Hello and good morning. How are you doing? Arrow, doing great. How are you? Absolutely excited to talk with you guys. And I'm, I'm almost afraid to talk. And the reason why is because there are so many videos out there right now on YouTube that are already describing the new season and, and the special that's coming up on Thanksgiving. So it's like, oh, I don't want to be one of those spoilers. Yeah, we'll try to keep it spoiler free. <laughs> yeah, we'll do our best. Do our best. Can you believe how big this has become? I mean, wow. I'm I'm in awe. Like it's crazy that 10 years on we are sitting here doing this. I never would have thought and I knew it was going to be big because I I have always been since I first saw like the little teaser in the pilot. Um I knew it was going to be a big show, but uh, it's just been incredible how how much it keeps on growing. If it, it's such a a crazy blessing and such a crazy, the odds of this happening were insane. So, very happy. It really takes us into an area where I I swear that every generation can relate with this show because a- every episode there's a piece of us inside of this story. Yes, agreed. I I love going to conventions and meeting folks that have seen the shows, uh, especially families that watch Mm -hmm. together. And it's so fun to meet the kids and and see their excitement. But it's the parents that sometimes are even more excited to talk to us um, because they're like, finally, we found a show that we love also. Um, and it's it's just great that the whole family can watch. Yeah. The animation itself is so spectacular. It's not the typical animation. You, it's like you have your own brand and image every single time there's an episode. Yes, the animators have been incredible. And actually for the new season, um, we're getting brand new animation. The character designs are a little different. Um, and it 
it, it looks beautiful. Yeah, the world around the characters are, are, is really incredible. Uh, I was able to take my family to Paris last year and got a little behind the scenes tour of the animation studio. I was watching them recreate Paris from scratch. Okay. And it's so incredible how true to life the imagery is and the buildings and the backgrounds, like they're just, the characters are living in such a beautiful world uh, that really brings the show to life. I love that the fact that you guys are doing this thing for Thanksgiving with the miraculous world London at the edge of time. I mean, this right here, this is, and, and you talking about it so early gives us the opportunity to get really excited about something. Yes. Um, it's it's a really beautiful episode. Um, so much happens. It bridges season five and season six. Mm-hmm. And th- there's a lot of unexpected drama and twists and turns and watching the characters deal with the consequences from that crazy season five finale. Yeah, and if you're hearing this now and you never watched the show, you still have time to binge all you five seasons. Binge it all, yes. Yeah, get caught up and be ready to go into... Uh, season six which could be the best season yet yeah modern day technology allows us to do that and that's what i love about disney plus is the fact that they are right there for their fans and it just continues to grow yes agreed how do you react to the merchandising and the toys and the costumes i mean i mean it all starts with you two i mean it's, it's like how does it grow from there and become such a world thing oh man yeah, I mean, it's it's so fun to see and meet people that bring all of their toys and come and cosplay to the convention. So you you really see that our work has resonated with them. Um, that's that's my favorite thing. Yeah, and just watching kids in costumes, like yeah. not even just on Halloween, all year round. <laughs> uh, I see so many so many cosplayers. Um, all the the dolls that have come out are incredible. I just a friend gifted me the Eiffel Tower playset. It's it's pretty remarkable to see. Um, I'm not sure I've been a character in my <laughs> career that has this much merch. Wow. So then the facial expressions and the emotions that go into it, I, I, I just envision you guys are standing in front of a, of, a, of a green screen and it's measuring everything that you guys would do in real life. Because, I mean, you guys capture emotion so well with this. Well, Thank you. I think that's um, a a huge compliment for voice actors. They're actually not capturing our faces and our reactions, but we're adjusting our voices in the moment uh, without ever seeing a script before we get into the studio and just trying to give real emotion through the microphone. So, you know, our intention is that that comes through and if if you're seeing it in that way if it feels real then i i, I think we're doing a good job and, you, you in know, a lot of ways i feel like uh the animators are uh, the unsung hero of a lot of animation because mm-hmm. they went and they crafted that so that we could perform to it and we're just the lucky ones who get to come in at the end and and uh bring the characters, given the final breath of life. Exactly. There's a big call right now for voice actors to be included in the Academy Awards. You, you guys have got to be on that same team. Oh, definitely. Uh, that would be absolutely incredible to see that sort of recognition. Yes. Um, we can only hope. We can only hope. Voice actors and stunt people. Let's let's get them on the the Academy Awards. Definitely. Well, you guys are still real when it comes to the, the presentation of entertainment because AI technology can't take over human emotion. Exactly. Yeah, we bring uh, a lot of history and our mm-hmm. own selves mm-hmm. into the booth and just pour it into the mic. I, uh, I, I don't think that you can capture that history and that background and all of those things that are real about the actors that are part of these shows. How do you For guys, sure. how do you guys preserve your voices? Because I mean, I mean, you know what it's like, even just having a conversation with somebody in America, you, you know, that your voice is always, you know, on that line. Oh man. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't do much and I use it a lot. So knock on wood, I just drink <laughs> a lot of water. Yes. I don't. Yeah, I can't really tell you how I preserve my voice because I scream all the time. Yeah. Uh, Miraculous <laughs> isn't the only series that uh, we're working on at the moment. Usually you're jumping between show and yep. show and booth and booth and character and character. So uh, a lot of my characters tend to scream. Um, and 
yeah, I just love it. And conventions on the weekends. Oh, yeah, absolutely. screaming at people too. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of water, a lot of water. Where can people go to find out more about Mir- Miraculous? Um, you can go to, oh, you could follow the official Miraculous accounts on Instagram. They always have the latest news, nice. even before we do. Um, the first five seasons are streaming on Disney+. Plus. Uh, season six is coming soon. Uh, there is the movie that's exclusively on Netflix, the, the full-length feature. Um, there's so many different places. Yeah, and if you want to see some of the fun that we're having, I think you should follow us, too. That's yeah, right. follow yeah. us on Instagram. You can right? find me at... Bryce Pappenbrook on Instagram and X. Yeah, and I'm Christina VOX. I love it. Please come back to the show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you. Harold, thanks so much. Appreciate you having us. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? You too. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Got one cap on it. That's good, yeah. (laughs) You're sweet. One of my crazy loves in life, talking with authors, getting inside their patterns and their processes. And oh man, did we ever do that with Sylvia Lurch. She's from Australia. She's 80. We're talking with her next. Are you there, Sylvia? Um, yes, good morning. Good. Oh, good morning. That's right. You're in Australia. It's nighttime here. So good evening. Good morning. Thank you. Yes. Good evening to you. Your journey as a writer inspires me because one of the things that as as a as a journalist as well as an author has always been to be so loyal and dedicated to inviting people to the page with words and look at where you're growing right now. Yes, words are so important, aren't they? And we're so lucky to have the English language which is so rich in ways of expressing ideas and thoughts and meanings it's wonderful you know australia has always been that glorious oh my god place but what you do is you help share the history of australia in a way that takes place in the 1920s yes it's a very rich time of history Um, it's part of the industrial revolution it must have brought massive changes to life the quality of life um think of the people who were losing their um their livelihood people like wheelwrights and horseshoe makers and um forge workers and so forth because engines were taking over there were massive differences that is so amazing you say that, that the engines were taking over because in this age where we are right now, it's AI taking over, whereas in your book, it's about engines taking over. Absolutely. Yes, today's technology is just breathtaking, isn't it? To be able to speak to you now like this, it's it just takes my breath away. But it, there must have been massive changes in the 1920s my grandfather bought the second motor car ever sold, the second automobile, you would say, ever sold in Tasmania and took it home to the sheep station there. Well, it, it must have been the start of huge changes. He loved horses so much. That's why he bought the automobile, because he hated to see horses neglected and abused. And he thought if people just have cars and engines, it won't matter. I laugh at a moment like this because my grandfather was in Wyoming here in the States and his love for pigs was amazing. He didn't want to drive his car. He wanted to be with his pigs. He wanted to be with his cattle. He wanted to be with everything that was all about nature and survival. That's wonderful. Yes. Uh, I think it's a great pity that so many people today are so disconnected from the source of their food, for instance. City people no longer understand the life of a pig. They just enjoy the bacon. <laughs> and, uh, it's so true because we would take the slop out there and give it to the pigs and they would roll around in it and have all that kind of fun. I'm sure you, en- you endured that kind of stuff in your country as well. Absolutely. And I still, although I'm octogenarian, I still have a few chooks and a rooster and that way... <laughs> No food goes to waste. It all gets recycled into eggs or um, compost for the garden so I can grow vegetables and enjoy the seasons and know that the vegetables I'm eating haven't been sprayed by some ghastly chemicals and stuff. 
it's a much better quality of life, I think, to be closer to natural things. I got to ask you about a, a chicken question, because one of the things that we did when raising chickens in Montana was the fact that we gave them rotten milk because it made the chicken eggs stronger. We always also gave them cottage cheese because chickens will eat everything. But those eggs were so important to us and we needed to have those shells hard as rock. Yes, uh, they are very sensible creatures too. Yes. They only eat what they need, whereas a horse will eat itself to death. A horse will founder because it's eaten too much, but a hen will never eat too much. They select what they need, and the size of the egg is determined by the amount of protein they eat and, um, of course, the color of the yolk is beautiful if the hen is eating greens yes yes and, uh, commercial eggs commercial chicken feed includes a dye to make sure the yolks are an acceptable color but the dye happens to be carcinogenic but they don't bother to advertise that do you feel like you were called to this story because australia has always been the mysterious place i mean it's it's almost like we don't know what real you know kangaroos okay and bitch my sandwiches okay we get it but but you give us a lot more than just that it is a, a mysterious place because it's been a melting pot for so many cultures the uh, original uh, white settlers here were convicts and uh, really? soldiers of course but then um once gold was discovered, there was a gold rush and people from every nation came here. Um, the ships arriving here couldn't leave again because the crews just walked ashore and walked up to the gold fields. They weren't going to go back to sea. Um, so uh, there was a great melting pot of people here, most of them here looking for something for nothing, of course, but it turned into... Um, a, a, a kinship and a camaraderie that has survived. Um, what we sum it up as a fair go. Everybody deserves a fair go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in doing the research for this book, what, what did you put yourself into knowing that you've lived all this? Well, a lot of the information yep. uh, comes comes from my parents' first-hand experience of that era. My father was born in 1902, my mother in 1906. So the 1920s were a very vivid and memorable part of their life. And there were endless stories about that era that my mother would tell, for instance. And I just found it uh, so interesting and so absorbing and i believe what i learned from them was authentic rather than the typical picture of the 1920s which is one of gay abandon and dancing with charleston and <laughs> sort of <laughs> defying convention um, but the the constraints of the era were still there there was still no reliable contraceptive, for instance, and uh, women were expected to get married. And if they got married, they then had to give up their financial yep. independence. Yep. They weren't able to work. And uh, the man was supposed to be the head of the household, unless it was an uxorious marriage, that wonderful word, um, a wonderful scrabble word. And... Um, so interesting the way that word is recorded in the Oxford English Dictionary. But um... you speak of the Charleston, and the thing is, is that I'm 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 just maybe 150 miles from Charleston, South Carolina, where all that started, and it just it just you know I mean it, it's like I'm here in the roots of that. I I never even thought about the Charleston even being danced in Australia. Oh heavens, yes, oh, yes, goodness. <laughs> wow.
it brings great pain to me to think that women were not treated as respectable as we try to do today. But at the same time, in this modern day world, I think this book is important because because I, it's like we almost we, we want to go back to those days, but we can't go back to those days. And we need authors like yourself to say, do not do it. Well, I think women were accorded enormous respect in those days for the function of giving birth. Um, uh, Women gave birth to babies and out of respect for that, no other animal was ever given that terminology. Uh, Kittens were littered, puppies were whelped, calves and foals were dropped. Um, But today, the, that whole respect associated with that seems to have evaporated. The other day I read somewhere where um, even marine coral is said to be born now instead of spawned. Yep. It's said to be born. And to me, that is diminishing the value of the the wonderful, wonderful thing in life that women have the opportunity to achieve, and that's motherhood. It's so funny you say that because when you step into my room, and and I call it the womb, this room, W-O-M-B, because I believe that creativity is given birth inside this room because it's in honor of my motherhood. And and the thing is, is that it's it's like, how why why is it we will not honor mothers the way they need to be? I I ask that question too, Um, but I think because the times have changed and contraception is now so reliable, for instance, I think it's too easy for couples to postpone starting a family and uh, time slips by and uh, what's... um, yeah, time slips by and women suddenly discover they're really too old to start a family yep. and they've yep. missed it. That's, but um, I, I'm intrigued that you call your your room a womb because it has such a richness about the meaning of the word, doesn't it? It's fascinating. Well, it does because this is where creativity is given life, and I got that from my mother. And so, to so to read your words, I'm so connected because it's so important that 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 we have to honor the the moms and and women of the world because that that's where it all begins. Without mothers and moms, what what, what do we have? Exactly, exactly, um, and it is now possible to understand that. A woman can be a surrogate mother. Yeah, uh, feeble yeah. knowledge of science and so forth has caught up with that. But, um, yeah, motherhood to me was the most wonderful thing in my whole life. I am so happy to be a woman. I think to be a man must be, um, oh, how can I put it without sounding trite or something rather? <laughs> It can't be the same thing to be a father as it is to be a mother, I'm but li- that's just no opinion. I'm with you, and I'm saddened these days that motherhood has come under attack because here in the states, that that motherhood also includes adopting children, and and here in the states, uh, they, they, it's come under attack because they feel like, oh, you're just a cat woman. It's like, what? Are you kidding me? Motherhood is wherever you know it, it's loving a child and growing with a child. Yes, yes. If you have produced that child, it's so much richer. But yes. you're right. Yeah. To adopt a child is just as valuable. So in writing this book, it, it's almost like you've given us a page of your soul. Did it feel like that when you were putting it on, on inside the book? Yes, you're right. Um, I... I can't do the things I used to do anymore, like riding horses and bushwalking and so forth, but I can still write. And it becomes even richer, I think, when your circumstances are reduced. You're you're absolutely right. Um, And I wanted to create something that was intense, short, and... uh, I, th- 
I enjoyed the formatting idea of having different font for the two different um, diaries and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think that makes it much easier to read. Lots of people have told me it's a wonderful book for book clubs because it's short and full of curiosities and intense. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed writing it. And of course, there are things that are there, but you have to search them out. For instance, to be able to write a journal was a privilege. Not everyone learned to read and write. Um, education wasn't compulsory. And if you could read and write, you were at a huge advantage, of course. And it was quite an elitist thing to be able to say, oh, yes, I keep a journal. Yes. And, uh, Yes, these kind of things. Um, so so often uh, things are visible if you search it out. <laughs> like uh, Shakespeare's will, have you? <laughs> Shakespeare was married to Anne Hathaway, but it wasn't a successful marriage, but there was nothing, no way of divorcing in those days. <laughs> but he tells us it wasn't successful because in his will... What does he leave to his wife? The only thing he leaves her is my second best bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I've been a daily writer for 20, no, for 30 years. And the thing is, is that I, I believe so much in that writing because we're, we're writing to a future that doesn't exist yet. And so I always call it the dear future reader experience. Okay. Mm hmm yeah. Do you not feel the same thing with your story? I, I do, now that you pointed out. Yes. Hmm. Yes. And so much of history can be lost by just falling into the grave with all the people. My, my mother came with me once to a place in New South Wales called Warhawk, which is like a reconstructed museum village. Um, yeah, imitating what a town would have been like in the gold rush era. Oh, my God. And it, it's really interesting. They have a wood-fired bread oven and that kind of thing, and they have a coach drawn by four horses that comes galloping through the town. And they also have a, a bullock wagon. <clears throat> and the bullock wagon appeared, and I thought my mother would be very interested in that. And... There, I think there were four bullocks or maybe six. And, of course, there's no bridles or reins in the bullocks. They're just yoked together. And um, the this bullocky was sitting on the empty timber jinker that the bullocks were pulling. And my mother took one look at this and she just said, Oh, that's <laughs> so wrong. I can't, I can't look. Take me away. And I said, what on earth is the matter? And she, she, she explained that the Bullockies were um, rough, tough men. Their language was the foulest in the whole of the nation. They were devoted to their Bullocks. And they, had, they all had this unwritten pact, which was absolutely inviolable. <laughs> they had this agreement that they would expect their Bullocks and whip them into action to pull massive loads, <laughs> massive loads of timber and wool and so forth, but they would never, ever, ever expect the bullocks to carry the weight of the bullocky himself. He always walked beside the team, and there was this man sitting on the timber jingle. My mother just couldn't couldn't bear the sight of it. <laughs> I, so, I lost I laugh because my mother was, I mean, she was so correct with her way of life, but she didn't embrace the new age. And I, just to hear this just makes me laugh so much because my mom was so strong with the past. Yes, yes. I, I think I would enjoy meeting her. <laughs> That, and that, and I think that's why people need to dive into your book because it is it. You know, the one thing I've, I'm learning is that Generation Z and the Alpha Generation are they want to know these older stories, and you are here in this moment of now. And I would love to see the research about how many younger people are going to be drawn to this. 
Wow, that that's wonderful. I hope it reaches the younger generation. It um, it is a reality, if you like. It is a real story. The mm-hmm. figures um, are true. The um, statistics of how many acres you need to graze one sheep in this arid country, and the other f- the figures are correct. It was true that one pound in weight, that's 500 grams of greasy fleece of a sheep's back, one pound in weight, paid a white man's wages for a month. It was a staggering amount of money. Mm -hmm. Each sheep carries so many pounds of wool and flocks of sheep are numbered in thousands. It, It was staggering wealth that came into this country through the wool industry. And, uh, of course, that put a huge responsibility on the shoulders of the people who received that income, and most of them handled that responsibility well, building churches and and schools and so forth out of their private purse. And uh, I think there was a better understanding of moral obligation which of course is so close to religion and um, but young people today are divorced from religion really they just say science disproves it but um, i hope lots of young people read my book and learn from it and research the historical information and uh, benefit well, I think it's because they're not connected because people don't talk about it, but you put it inside your pages and it gives people the opportunity to explore it, which then will lead people back to where it is that you want to talk about. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Wow. I'm so pleased. <laughs> wow. Where can people go to find out more about your writing and the book, as well as everything that you are bringing into the world today? Um, to to purchase a copy, you just need to go to the publisher. That's Austin Macaulay in England. And it's available as a hard copy or as a Kindle copy. And also they recorded it. Um, oh, what do you really? call that? Oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And um, hopefully one day it might be a movie. Ah? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can see it. I can see it or a 10 part series on Netflix. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, I can I can totally see it on that because this is the kind of stuff that we have embraced in this modern day world. This is a story that we can put into our hearts. Absolutely. Yes, and it's it's part of history. We should all um, retain our history, whatever it is, good or bad. Yeah. And uh, yes. Mm. Do you ever ask why did it take so long for this to happen? I'm sorry, I don't really understand. In other words, why did it take so many years for you to put the pen to the paper, to the words uh, in the book, or into the what what it could become? I mean, this is several different years that that it took to bring it out. Yes, well, perhaps I was too busy doing other things. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yes, enjoying life to the full and bringing up children. I get it. I now have six great grandsons. How did that happen? So so (laughs) between the two of us, I have a grandchild, but I don't have a great grandchild. What is that going to be like for me when I have a great grandchild? How is my life going to change? Well, you... You have an expanse of history before you and uh, a a wonderful sense of infinity (laughs) and, uh, yes, a feeling of um, eternity, really. Life goes on and it's wonderful and we all have to make the very best of it. I love where your heart is. You've got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you very much. I really enjoy it. You be brilliant today, okay? Thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. Um, This is modern technology that I'm hopelessly out of date with it and stubbornly not adopting it usually, but I've loved this. Thank you very much.